I do think that what they're trying to do is definitely better than something like Open Core. Open Core is... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> open Core is a minefield. It's... <laughs> It can be done well, and it can be done very bad. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that range, yeah, it, it's a wide range. You've got to see some projects that are open core, mm -hmm. um, but then if you actually go into them, then you remove the non-open code and then try to build them and run them, you can't do because they actually depend on the proprietary code. And yeah, you, you know, that's, that's not an open source project at that stage. Um, and that's something that I also try and um, raise to combat, but it's also one of those things that's much more difficult to judge and get into because a lot of the times you don't know until you cipher through the project and a lot of the times they have much more complex licensing. They'll be under mm -hmm. one license except for one particular folder or maybe some other files yeah. that you have to search for that might have a different license <laughs> header file. And it, it can be abused and it is abused quite a lot um so yeah I, I agree i'd rather see someone move into this space of um you know fair source or somewhere else within the source of adol space whatever you name it under that's very open and honest about the freedoms that they're providing or not providing than the mess that can be in open source in open core um i think open core it can be done well if, if, a, if a company really separates out the parts of their project if they have a very clear okay this is our open source offering and this is our paid um proprietary offering mm -hmm. if that's clear to users then i personally don't have an issue with that um, as long as contributors know what rights they're giving up or providing or what might be done with their code as long as users know what they're using um what troubles me is when you see a project, you know, it'll be posted on Reddit, mm -hmm. you know, check out the latest updates in our open source project, but then you go into it and then maybe look on their homepage and like five of the features are only right. available in the enterprise licensing and you have to pay extra for um, authentication options. And right. it's just right. like this, this isn't within the spirit and it's actually quite misleading. And I do advocate, to, I've done a few times now to companies like, please, can you separate this out? Because how you're advertising here is it's not clear at all. I think before we get way too sidetracked on that, um, for anyone who doesn't know and hasn't heard the term open core, open core is basically when it's done cleanly, obviously there are cases where you just can't build it unless you have both parts, but when it is done cleanly, you have an open source core of the project and then a larger generally proprietary but you can have other source available or other sorts of licenses where the other part of the project is under that so a great example of this two great examples actually bitwarden and gitlab i think they do it in a fairly clean way where if you're using the open source version of bitwarden which is the version you get if you're using the free version you get basically everything that you want from the project. Everything that you would need from a password manager, Bitwarden has there. There are oh, there are things you might want. There is a, some additional things for sure, but Bitwarden's main focus is making money off of the enterprise users. And I think that's probably as clean of a separation as you can get. GitLab is in a fairly similar model where GitLab's core is open source. You can go and host yourself. You can go and do all that stuff. But then they also have their paid tier that has a lot more features that if you are running a big company might make a lot of sense for you. But most people, if they're just doing development, it probably doesn't matter to them. Yeah, I'm not sure about Bitwarden, but I did use um, GitLab for a while. Mm hmm half a decade now ago and from what i saw then they did do it quite well uh, it seemed like they always labeled the open source offering gitlab ce so it was mm. under a different name and then on their updates page it was clearly labeled um what versions were in the open offering or what were in the ce version and i think yeah, it all comes down to clarity and i've been meaning to do a blog post on what counts as an open source project because it's a bit more of an abstract term than what is open source code mm -hmm. um 
because initially I would have thought just you know a project that you can run on open source code alone but then you get into these edge cases like I thought about um open RCT2 or open road coaster tycoon 2 mm. where it's an open source project but to run it to make use of it you need a copy original copy of the game which isn't open source so right. is that an open source project I'd still say that that is um mm. so I generally go by if you can use the value that's being advertised for that project on open source code, then that's what you consider as an open source project. Well, that sounds fairly similar to like a game emulator where the game emulator itself is open source, but it's not very useful unless you actually have the ROMs to run in the emulator. Yeah, exactly. So it's not always just about yeah being able to run something. It's just uh, can you get can you get the value that right. you're being told you're going to get from that project mm. under the open source code alone? Right, right. That does make sense. So I would imagine there probably are some projects which don't have a clear like they where you you have part of the project open source, but realistically, it's not actually. Like, in some cases, I would imagine that you have issues even building stuff without having some other part there as well. Where they just have a part... They have it open, so open source, but it's it's not really useful without whatever else they have they're not showing you. Yeah. And this is this is where open core gets difficult. And it's it's hard to even double check this from a user perspective especially if you're not familiar with the code or mm. the specific languages um that they're using like mm. i recently came across a project called papermark mm. and as part of that you know i just i, I generally have a quick scan through the code because i'm interested in how projects license themselves and you go to that on github and github just shows you it's agpl3 license mm. Um, so you might think, oh, that's just under the AGPL3 license. And then within the readme, there's nothing about any additional license terms. There's nothing there to state otherwise. In, actually, in the readme at the top, there's another little badge, license AGPL v3. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the license file itself, that's unmodified. Um, AGPL v3, that's what GitHub's picking up, basically. But I did notice there's also an EE folder which is usually a bit of a warning sign. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but then if you go into that, you'll find another license file um, that is a commercial license that requires you to like, uh, basically have a commercial subscription to their software. And so what I do when seeing that is then I search across the whole repo for like slash EE slash, and then I can find other parts of the project that might not be in that folder that mm -hmm. depend on code within that folder. Um, which is the case here, and uh, I picked that up with the author because it's not clear to users. If you go to that project, it's not clear there's another license involved. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that you're essentially going to be running that other code um, that requires an enterprise commercial license when you run the project in general, mm -hmm. and it's required by a lot of those other files. And it's not obvious why that's there as well, because when you go into it, it actually defines quite arbitrary limits like... Uh, you know, like team counts and stuff like that, really just numerical values. Um, but looking over the project, it's advertised as open source, all happy and everything. Um, but it's not clear that just at least from the repository itself, that there's quite arbitrary limits um, put upon it, which, you know, many may see against what they might be advertising since advertising as a, you know, for the open source project. This... Uh is this like a common thing, like to have your your limits just in a file in your repo? It's. I it's, <laughs> I've never seen this, but I don't go around like digging deep into how projects like do their licensing. I've never seen this before. That's that's how some projects do it. Um, they'll just have a whole bunch of numbers. So technically, you could scrap up that e folder and then re-implement those files yourself. It gets to be a question of okay, what's how how much can you change those or re-implement them without them being exactly the same, really? Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, these projects do it in all different ways. The projects that do it well mm -hmm. will keep their 
enterprise code or their differently licensed code in a completely separate repo, maybe sure, it's private yeah. as well. And then it gets joined in and gets put into a different product. And that's right. what I really support. Um, although then there's an in-between where they might just have completely different parts of code and then they might have like a script that kind of patches over that with enterprise code. Right. So the core project works perfectly fine as is and is all perfectly usable. Um, but this is the this is a sketchier example, especially because it's hidden. And unfortunately, this is um, frustratingly quite common. Um, I think from when I last checked, uh, cal.com, the company that I mentioned earlier, does the same thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they might have got, I know Papermark has some links to that project as well. So it's another example where things might have spread from one project to another, thinking, uh, you know, these, these terms are fine and the way that they're doing it is fine. But I think right. it could be a much more visibility. You know, I have nothing against them trying to, well, the arbitrary limits, uh, I think, are a bit iffy. I, I usually have that as a red flag, mm -hmm. um, but you know it's, it's up to them how they license their works as long as it's clear to the user. Yeah, yeah. That, I think, is a very important point. There's no issue... Like, I know, I know the free software people are going to be like, well, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. I, at the end of the day, I, if you have a project, I do not care how you want to license it. If you think the best way to license it is... MIT, do that. If you think the best way to license it is AGPL, do that. If you think the best way to license it is some open core solution or proprietary solution, and for whatever reason that is the approach you want to take, do that. But make sure that what you are doing, you understand it, and you convey what you are doing clearly so that people who are trying to interact with what you're doing are also aware of where they stand. Because if they are not aware of where they stand... Like, you cannot be surprised when people operate in a way that you don't think they should be operating. If you are not clear about how your license is, uh, how, how your license actually works and how your license applies to this project, you cannot be surprised when other people don't understand it either.